Okay, where has the time gone? Last, uh, last lecture. Who, uh, for how many of you is this your last class? Still a few more last classes, okay. Um, how many juniors do we have here today? A couple juniors, how many seniors? How many of you are leaving us this semester? Okay, all right. So um, let's wrap things up today. Uh, just an overview of what we're going to do today. Um, we will, uh, first of all, we're going to talk a little bit about the final exam period. We're going to go over the oral presentations and the written reports. I've updated all the instructions about what's expected for the oral presentation and written report, and we'll go over that in a moment. Uh, we got a lot of presentations to get through in uh, a little less than three hours. So we're going to go over all the expectations. There's a lot of moving pieces, but if everyone plays their part, everyone will get a chance to show off their best work uh, in the time that we have available. OK, so we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, just to refresh your memory, last time we had Nick Cheney visiting us. Uh, Nick Cheney is alumnus of the course. He's now doing a PhD on soft robotics and is working on the Tensegrity robot project uh, that NASA has been working on for the past few years. So Nick was here telling us about soft robotics last time. Last week, I was telling you about this uh, project called Robots That Can Adapt Like Animals. This is sort of the most recent uh, high-profile project in the field where, uh, like we've seen before, a robot becomes unexpectedly damaged and tries to recover from that unanticipated situation. So that's lecture 28. We got partway through that last time, so we'll do the last part of Lecture 28 uh, today. I'll refresh your memory about that project, and we'll, we'll conclude our discussion about that. So uh, at that point, then, whatever time we have remaining will be for an open discussion. Uh, as I mentioned, I've done most of the talking in this, this course. I will turn the floor over to you. We'll have an open-ended discussion about things we haven't talked about, about robotics, where do you think the field is going, questions, comments, ideas uh, that you have. Sound good? Um, other housekeeping notes, course evaluations. I see that some of you have filled it out. Thank you very much. If you have not filled out an evaluation for this course, please do. Uh, I do look at those evaluation forms and try and use them to improve the course for next year. So do next year students a favor and fill out uh, that form and please be honest. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the oral presentations and the written report. Um, obviously, all of the oral presentations will be here next Thursday, 10.30 a.m., and if everything goes smoothly, we should finish well before uh, 1.15. The schedule of oral presentations is now up. You can have a look at it. Uh, you can have a look at it here. Um, again, and I can't say this enough, everyone has exactly three minutes. Please do not go over. Um, everything is here. There will be uh, ten three-minute presentations, so we'll have a, a half-hour block of presentations. Then you'll have a, a ten-minute break. Get up, stretch your legs. You can ask the speakers any questions that you had. Obviously, in three minutes, there isn't really time for Q&A. Please do approach the speakers during the 10-minute break and ask them about their project. Uh, then a second set of 10, a second break, a third set of 10 presentations, a third break, the last eight presentations. And if all goes smoothly, we should finish around 12.54. OK. Uh, we'll go through the instructions uh, in a moment. Um, I want to apologize. I am actually not going to be here for the oral presentations, but I am going to try and be here remotely uh, via Skype. So Owen, the teaching assistant, will be here and will be running the proceedings next Thursday. Um, at this time, I'm going to be attending uh, a conference uh, in Australia, and our host are the, is the Department of De Australian Department of Defense. They are interested in using some of the ideas that we've talked about in this course for what uh, the armed forces refer to as trusted autonomy. So as you can imagine, a lot of uh, military uh, personnel are interested in creating machines that are autonomous and that can also be trusted. And again, maybe that's something we can talk about during the open discussion period today. So I will be in Australia while you are presenting 
Um, and what we're going to do is Owen is going to call me on Skype. So you will be presenting up here. Owen is going to share his screen with me so I can watch your videos and hopefully watch you uh, as well. That's plan A. Um, I don't know how well Skype will hold up from Australia mm -hmm. while we're sharing screens and so on. So plan B is you will continue to present as normal and I will watch your presentations after the fact. Sound good? Okay, we'll see, uh, we'll see how this goes. So given the fact that I'm not here, uh, I've updated the instructions to try and make this go as smoothly as possible and I want to just go through this so we're all on the, the same page about this. Uh, as I mentioned, the scheduled presentations is already up. Uh, I won't be here. I am going to try and observe the presentations remotely through Skype. Each of you is going to create uh, a three-minute video um, and upload that video to YouTube. There's pointers in here about video editing software if you need it. Um, let's see. If it's more than three minutes, we're going to deduct grades because, again, we've got a lot of presentations to, to get through. I've updated this. I asked you originally to create a silent video that you'll talk over. What I would like you to do is make a video that you either, uh, that either also contains your voice or you have uh, captions at the bottom. So obviously if things don't work out with Skype next Thursday, I can watch all of the videos on YouTube and I can hear you explaining your visuals over the three minute uh, period. When Owen plays the presentations here in class, he will just mute the laptop and you will speak over your three minute uh, presentation. Make sense? Okay. Okay, let's see. Uh, each student will speak over their video. Um, if I can't, if I can't connect by Skype, I'll watch them after, after the fact. Okay. There's instructions here to give you some hints about um, how to actually put together your video. Obviously, three minutes is not a lot of time at all, right? So even if your video is exactly three minutes, it's going to run and you should be able to talk along with it at the pace your video runs, which is not an easy thing to do if you haven't done it before. So make sure that you make your three minute video in plenty of time and that you practice talking over your video as it runs, right? The most important thing in such a short presentation is timing and pacing. Right? Um, one of the most difficult things I've seen for students in the past is their three minute video starts and they're talking about their methods and their video has already moved on from their methods and is already showing videos of evolved behaviors. Right? You, don't, you don't want to be trying to explain your video and trying to catch up with it as it's running ahead. So practice, practice, practice. Okay. Um, again, I've asked for specific things in the itemized list here that we would like to see in the three minutes. Obviously, you can't go into a lot of detail for each of these points. We don't expect you to go into a lot of detail for these points. That's for the written report, right? The written report, you've got much more space to explain things in detail. What we'd like to see in the video is obviously the highlights. So, for example, when you introduce your method, you might have one or two slides that highlight your method, and you want to highlight those aspects of your uh, method that are novel, right? I started with the quadruped, and I added wheels to the bottom of the legs, which you can see here, and make sure you have a visual that helps make that, make that clear, right? We don't want to see 12 bullets that you have to read off um, as you go to explain your method. We don't care too much about the nuts and bolts in the presentation, just what's novel, what did you have to change. If you turned your legged robot into a wagged robot, you can show a picture of your wagged robot and you can say in a few words, I had to make change in the bullet code here and I had to expand my matrix of synaptic weights to include extra motors for the wheels. <laughs> That's it, right? About 30 seconds, that should be enough to make clear to everybody what you've changed. What is the, what's the heart of your methods? Okay, the heart of the video obviously is going to be videos of your robot uh, in action. I would like for most of you to, tr to present just two videos, one of an evolved behavior and one of a random behavior, right? And if we watch, if we all watch those two videos, it should be pretty clear from those videos 
what you were able to achieve, right? What's, what's different? We've seen that in a lot of the projects we've looked at in this class. We've seen an evolved behavior and we've seen a random behavior. And just looking at those two, you get a pretty good handle on what the investigators were trying to achieve, right? So pick your two videos very carefully. You can have them play side by side or play one and then the other. Doesn't matter, right? By random, you mean like unhooked from your hill climber? Exactly. Or the first parent yeah. before the hill climber actually starts running, right? So what is, what is random behavior? What does the robot do if no evolution or no hill climbing occurs? And after 100 iterations of your hill climber, you got this. Right? Whatever this is. Now this, the evolved behavior may not match your final milestone. Right? That's fine. Just explain that to us. This is how far you've managed to get with your final project. Okay. Again, depending on your timing, you may have time to show more. But what we're really looking for is, did you manage to evolve anything? If you show two videos and we can't tell which one is the random and which one is the evolved, you got a problem. Right? Make sure you can convince us that you've been able to evolve something for your, for your robot. Okay, uh, point number seven, um, we're looking for some kind of, of results. Again, you don't have a lot of time, so don't make anything too complicated. Um, throughout this course, we've seen lots of different attempts by different researchers to visualize how evolution unfolded in their experiment. The most obvious one is uh, a fitness curve. So for some of you, you've got two different robots, and you're trying to compare robot A to robot B. So some of you are comparing uh, a hexapod robot to a quadruped robot. Or some of you are changing the evolutionary algorithm, the hill climber. So how does the robot, how well are you able to evolve the robot with and without your high-powered evolutionary algorithm. The simplest way to do that is to do multiple runs, multiple evolutionary runs, with your two systems, right? So maybe you run the quadruped with the hill climber, and you get fitness curves that look like this. Over evolutionary time, you pull out the hill climber, and you put in the more high-powered evolutionary algorithm you've been working on. You re-evolve you re the quadruped, and now you start to get fitness curves that look like this, right? So in one picture, you can show us that your more high-powered evolutionary algorithm is doing something compared to the relatively weak hill climber. Right? Now again, not all of you are comparing A to B. Uh, if you are, this might be a good way to go. So we want you in step seven here to show us in this video that you thought carefully about how to present to us what you've managed to achieve in your final project. Right? Some of you may be focusing on the kind of behavior you were able to evolve. So if you go back and look at lecture 12, uh, you'll remember the footprint graph, which was a single image showing how the robot actually moved, not how far it got, not its fitness, but which foot hit the ground at which time. In the footprint graph, you could see very clearly was the robot's movement rhythmic or was it sort of chaotic, right? So pick your, your visualizations uh, carefully. There were a lot of great visualizations in lecture 10 when we talked about minimal cognition, right? The little Space Invaders robot that moves along the bottom of the screen and threads between the pair of objects uh, and so on, right? The uh, investigators in that project went to a lot of effort to try and devise a single static image that communicated a lot of information about the evolved behaviors. That's what we're looking for as well. OK, uh, so that's about 30 seconds, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Takes you about a minute, a half, or two minutes. Uh, you should include one slide outlining what aspects of the final project you found particularly challenging and what you learned from overcoming them. So one slide, again, maybe about 30 seconds, describing your process, right? Which aspect was particularly challenging? How did you, how did you overcome it? You remember uh, a few lectures back, I was telling you about the robot that grows legs, and I was telling you about how we put it on a linear actuator and actually extruded the leg from out of the body, that was a challenging thing to do, right? That's the kind of thing that we're looking for 
uh, in point A here. The last uh, 30 seconds of your presentation, you should just summarize if you had another year to work on your project, where would you go with it? Right? So this item here is, going, is your opportunity to convince us that you thought about the implications of your work, right? We've had only five or six weeks, you've only had five or six weeks to work on this, you can only get so much done. But, but having gone through that process, you should now understand better the challenges of whatever it is you're trying to achieve in the long term. And by, by explaining to us in as much detail as you can manage in 30 or 45 seconds, where you would go, that sort of shows us that you've thought carefully about your project. Right? If you show us a hexapod compared to a quadruped and say, that's what I've implemented, thank you very much, that's obviously, there's not real thought there in why you would bother doing this and why this matters that there is this, this difference. Okay, and again, just three minutes. Practice, practice, practice. Any questions? We're all good on the oral presentation? Okay. Um, please make sure that you do uh, upload it. Uh, let's see, did I mention that here? Uh, sorry, right, here's some, some, and again, just about the audio track. So do make sure that you speak over it and you have that audio track added so I can watch these later if I need to. Um, as, you're, as you're adding, if you want to add subtitles or your voice, either is fine, but just keep in mind that I may have to watch it after the fact and you're not there to explain it to me. So what I just talked about, that should all be encapsulated in the audio track. Right? So in the audio track, here you can see in the top group of fitness curves that the hexapod is doing better than the quadruped. Right? Make sure that your audio or your subtitles talk to the visuals in the video. Okay. Uh, once you've made your video, mount it on YouTube as, as usual. Uh, we'd like a specific naming convention, which is there. Make sure that you submit your URL uh, in Blackboard by 11.59 p.m. on Wednesday, May 11th. So if you go to Blackboard, uh, you go to Final Project, you'll now find that there is an item there called Oral Presentation. The only thing you need to submit to that by Wednesday night is the URL that points to your three-minute video. That counts as a su successful submission of your oral presentation. Okay, between midnight and 10.30 a.m. the next morning, the teaching assistant will take all of those videos and stitch it together into one long uh, playlist. So obviously if you're late and you don't submit your video, it won't be in the playlist and you won't receive a grade for the oral presentation. Right? We can't put something in retroactively because we have a very tight schedule. At 10.30 uh, 10 a.m., Owen's going to press play on the playlist, and it'll just start playing through the videos. So make sure you get your video in time to be included in the playlist. Okay. Uh, again, they're going to just play one after the other. Uh, three minutes is not a lot of time, so be ready when the person before you is finishing. Get ready to come up to the front. You might start talking as you walk up to the front of the room. Uh, again, not a, not a lot of time, so you might want to practice this. Okay. Uh, again, I will try and be here by, by Skype, but you'll be mostly presenting to your fellow students and the teaching assistant. Uh, again, there won't be time for Q&A, so if you're in the audience and you have a question, please don't interrupt the speaker because they don't have a lot of time. Save your question and ask it of them during the 10-minute break. Okay. Have you um, seen a lot of, what kinds of challenges have you seen with people trying to use a phone? Right? Like Linux, I don't know if I'm going to, okay. what kind of video. Uh, video quality is not a big deal, so if you need to shoot Video, if you need to just shoot directly using your phone to the screen, that's, uh -huh. that's, that's no problem, right? Um, fast and cheap is perfectly fine as long as you cover the content that we want. So uh, if you don't want to fidget with video editing software, um, have your three-minute video, shoot it with your phone, and just speak. That's, that's fine. As long as you cover everything we want, that's, that's fine. We're not, there's no points here for slick videos. If you want, that's, that's fine. Whatever works. Okay. 
Uh, and then the written report, I haven't changed anything there, so it's the same uh, as before. The written report is simply the completed wiki page for your project. Right? So again, the main thing that we're looking for in the written report is a very clear documentation of what you've done. So by clear, that includes verbal communication, right? So make sure you write in full sentences, no spelling mistakes, grammatical mistakes. Write in as clear a way as you can to make clear to us what you've implemented. But most importantly, we're going to be looking at your written report and we're going to be imagining that we're a student next year who's trying to implement your project. So write as clearly as you, as you can. Okay. Again, you will also be submitting uh, b uh, by 11.59 p.m. on Wednesday, May 11th. And again, you'll now find that in Course Materials Final Project, there's uh, an assignment there called Written Report. And all you need to do is submit a URL that points to your wiki page on Reddit. That's it. Uh, and I think we've gone over all of this again, so in the interest of time, I won't... Uh, I won't go through all of this. Okay, I think that's, that's everything. Any questions about the oral presentation, written report? We're all clear. How long does your oral presentation have to be? Three minutes. Three minutes. Excellent. Okay, good. Uh, okay. Clarity and writing quality, that's all there. All right, um, so the schedule, obviously, it's all here. You know exactly when you're presenting. I would please like all of you to be here at 10, 10.30 to support your fellow uh, students. Uh, it should be a lot of fun. We've done this in the past. You're going to see a lot of cool things in a very short period of time. So please do be here by 10.30. Okay. All right, so let's finish off the last lecture now uh, of the course, Robots That Can Adapt uh, Like Animals. Just to reorient you, uh, this is a lecture that actually should have gone into the reality gap section. Um, it's a new project, so uh, I, I, I wasn't sure if we were going to have time to talk about it. We did, um, so it's here. Um, the reading and the original research paper are here. The reading is someone commenting on the work, so it's at a pretty pretty high level of detail. If you're interesting, if you're interested in the details of the project itself, you can go and read the original research paper, but that, as usual, is optional. Okay. Okay, so here we go, lecture 28, just to go over this. Last time, animals and humans were exceedingly good at recovering and carrying on with what we want to do in the face of major challenges like the loss of a leg or a major change to our environment. Right? This is not the African savanna where we evolved and where we were comfortable. We're doing a pretty good job. Maybe this, you could argue that point, but we're doing a pretty good job surviving and carrying on an environment that's quite different from the one in which we evolved. Not unlike what happens from moment to moment where you're continuously adapting to things that your genes were never have never seen before, right? How do we actually go about doing that? Still a bit of a mystery, but there's been a lot of attempts in robotics in general and evolutionary robotics in particular to do the same thing, create machines that can adapt on the fly to unexpected changes. Okay, so we were looking at this particular project last time. Uh, in this case, they used uh, a hexap uh, hexapod. It has a, a little bit of a camera in here. What's not mentioned in this slide here, um, which is important, is the robot has touch sensors so it can detect when a foot is in contact with the ground or not. Here's an example of a particular kind of damage that the robot might sustain. Once it does sustain this damage, it doesn't travel as far as it did before, right? So the goal of the robot is to travel forward. It finds that it's now listing to the left. So now the robot has to think, what should I, how should I change the way I move to recover fast, straight, forward locomotion? So the million dollar question really is how should a mis machine decide what to do next? So this overview slide doesn't show how the robot makes that decision. That's what we're going to look at in a moment. 
So just to give an overview, the robot is trying to attempt as few trials as possible to recover damage, right? A robot could do something like uh, use an evolutionary algorithm and try out 10,000 different things until it finally manages to move again, but you probably don't want a damaged machine attempting 10,000 partly random uh, gates. Right? You want it to intelligently choose, intelligently choose what to do next. Okay, so how did the robot go about doing that uh, in this project? I think we ended with this, uh, this slide here last time. We're going to start with the pretty standard evolutionary robotics setup. We're going to start with a simu simulated version of the robot. So we have our simulated undamaged hexapod. This robot has 18 motors and it's got some sensors. So if we hook up the sensors to the motors, we have a very large, large set of possible controllers. Right? So if you think about your four by eight matrix of synaptic weights, four times eight is 32. You have 32 numbers that are being optimized. You can think about those as a 32 dimensional search space, right? Every point, every location in that 32 dimensional space corresponds to one possible controller, right? If you have six, if you have those uh, if you have those 32 floating point values, you have almost an infinite number. Not quite, but pretty close, right? That's why we've been using evolution or throughout this course, right? How do we efficiently search this very high dimensional space? The innovation of this paper was they took this high dimensional space and they reduced it to a much lower search space. And this lower search space is, uh, is parameterized not by the genes or by the synaptic weights, not by the genotype, but instead by the phenotype or the behavior. In this little cartoon here, they've actually reduced the space to two dimensions, and those, uh, those two dimensions represent two numbers, which can range between zero and one. What do those two numbers represent? We talked about this at the end of class last week. They represent some, some aspect of the behavior of this hexapod. Like how much the foot is touching the ground? How much the foot is touching the ground, which foot? The way we talked about it last time was just imagine the front two feet. So we take some controller, maybe we take a random controller out of this very large search space, we <coughs> drop it into the simulated hexapod, the genotype, which is the set of synaptic weights, causes the robot to move, and the movement or the behavior is the phenotype, and we measure some aspect of the phenotype, which in this case is the fraction of time that the front left foot spends on the ground and the fraction of time that the front right foot spends on the ground. So we now have two numbers. We locate the position of that pixel using those two numbers. So those two numbers represent a position in this two-dimensional space. And we drop the controller and the fitness of that controller into that pixel. We store it at that, at that point. So the fitness is, as usual, the forward distance traveled by the hexapod. Right? So the position of any pixel in this two-dimensional space represents some aspect of the behavior produced by that controller. And the color of the pixel here represents how well the robot did. What was the fitness of the robot using that controller? Red is good. The robot traveled a long distance. Green is bad. The robot didn't go anywhere. OK. We take one controller here and run it on the hexapod and drop it here. We've only colorized one pixel, and all the other pixels are empty. Right? So let's take that one controller, make a randomly modified copy of it. So now we have a child controller. Run that second controller on the hexapod, and assume that, that controller is now going to produce a different behavior, which is probably going to cause the two front feet to spend a different amount of time on the ground, which will take us to a new position in this reduced behavioral space. And we drop that second controller and that second fitness value into that pixel and continue. 
right? So as we keep doing this, we're going to start colorizing pixels corresponding to different behaviors and the fitness associated with that behavior. Eventually, we're going to evaluate a controller here. And when we go to drop that controller at that position in this two-dimensional space, there's already going to be a controller there. What do we do when that happens? We replace it, right? So if the new controller produced higher fitness than the controller that's already in that pixel, throw the old one away and put the new controller in there. If the new controller produced lower fitness than the controller that's already inhabiting that position, you throw the new controller away. Make sense? So the investigators did that thousands and millions of times and eventually produced this picture here. Right? So this picture, or at least this cartoon, shows that there are four different behaviors for this hexapod that are doing a pretty good, pretty good job. So far, so good? Um, yes, Barry. A couple of questions. Sure. Thousands or millions of times, is that still not a lot relative to the high dimensional? Absolutely, it's not a lot, right? So it, it can do it really fast. Well, you just you could do as many as you can, right? And whatever time budget they had to run these experiments, that's as much as you do, right? This the space of all possible controllers that you could execute on your robot is always going to be, to all intents and pur uh, purposes, infinite, right? So that's why we're using evolution, or we're trying to use some machine learning algorithm that efficiently searches this space. This is the game we're always trying to play, right? When we play this game, we're always trying to balance two things, which is exploitation and exploration. Right? Exploitation says, hey, here's a good controller that works well for the robot. I'm going to try and exploit that fact by grabbing that controller, making a randomly modified copy of it, and maybe it actually ends up landing in the same position, producing even better fitness. Right? We're trying to exploit good solutions, and by making slight random modifications to them, we're trying to make them slightly better. But we're also balancing that exploitation with exploration, right? So maybe, um, maybe if we pick some pixels here and make randomly modified copies of them, they might land somewhere near here. And instead of being yellow, they might be red, right? We might just not have improved some mediocre solutions well enough. So this plane here contains I don't know what, what resolution they actually did this at, but it contains tens of thousands of different solutions. And they're always picking some of these and trying to improve them. Right? You're balancing exploitation versus exploration. Now, even if it is 10,000, it's much less than the number of all possible controllers. And the bot can do it really fast. Because it's, We're doing, because it's in simulation, right? We just they just took this hexapod and they just kept running this algorithm I just explained to you over and over and over again. And as they did, these empty pixels started to fill up. And as they filled up, some of the pixels turned redder and redder, right? Because evolution was making randomly modified copies and throwing away the controllers that didn't do as well as the controllers already occupying that space. If it was better, they put it back in, right? It's like, it's not that different from your hill climber, right? Except instead of one parent defending itself against the child, there's 10,000 parents defending themselves against the incoming child controllers. You're maintaining 10,000 different solutions and trying to improve on them as you go. And is it too simplistic to say it's kind of like, you know, uh, you're trying to, walk somewhere and you get hit and fall on the ground and you're blinded and you're trying to reach the doorknob or something and okay. you just try one solution to get to the doorknob and that doesn't work and you're blind so you just keep moving your hand around. Uh, yes, so, so this, this algorithm is actually called IT and E, which is intelligent trial and error. So yes, it's trial and error, right? They're trying a bunch of different things. But it's intelligent in the sense that it's not quite random, right? Because you're, you're biasing which controllers you keep and which ones you throw away, right? 
If it was random, you just sort of pick points in this infinite space and just keep going. And at the, if I give you three hours to run this on a computer, you pick these at random. And at the end of three hours, you just give me back the best controller you found at the end of that period. Right? That's complete trial and error, ran, random trial and error. That doesn't work as well as intelligent trial and error, right? where you're keeping some of the better ones uh, and trying to improve them over time. That's in essence what evolution is doing, right? It's trial and error by making mutations and crossing genetic material, but it's not completely random, right? Selection is acting here, favoring better solutions, keeping them around for longer, getting rid of the ones that don't work so well. Other questions? Okay, so we've talked now about reducing this space down to this space. We haven't talked about this other two-dimensional plane which exists above it. And this is called the confidence level here. And what it represents is the robot, the physical robot's confidence about whether this controller, which is red, does well for the simulated robot. Is it also going to do well for the physical robot? It's all blue for the moment. Blue is bad, meaning what? Blue is low in this case, low confidence. <clears throat> it hasn't even started. Hasn't done anything, right? We haven't even used the physical, the physical robot hasn't executed any controllers yet. We've just been doing this with the simulated robot. So for all of these controllers, so for every pixel here, there's a corresponding pixel in this confidence layer and that pixel represents a value between 0 and 1, which is how confident the physical robot is that that simulated controller will transfer from simulation to reality. It's all low. doesn't know yet. Um, does it judge the confidence level of other uh, behaviors by their similarity to the phenotype of other behaviors? Or yeah. Are you even pulling off? The answer is yes, and we're going to see how it does that in a moment. Oh, okay. But for the moment, we haven't got there yet, right? The physical robot is not confident about any of these controllers. Some of these controllers do better than others on the simulated robot, but whether that's true for the physical robot, doesn't know. Okay, physical robot, um, it's going around doing its thing. Let's say it's using a pre-programmed behavior. Maybe it's not using one that's been evolved yet, and the robot's leg breaks, and the robot says, okay, the controller that I was given originally no longer works, so I'm going to pick one of the controllers from uh, that I've that I've simulated uh, before. Which one would, should it pick? So let's imagine that this two-dimensional plane here represents 10,000 different controllers. The, ro the physical robot is going to pick one of these 10,000 and try it out and see if that allows it to recover from whatever's gone wrong. If you were the physical robot, which one would you pick here? Well, I'd start somewhere other than my immediate phenotype because if it's not working for me, then it's not going to make the behaviors that are similar to you, you could do that, right? So the robot could say, okay, I, I know something about the amount of time that my two front legs are touching the ground. That didn't work. I'm going to pick something differently. Uh, you could also specifically look for ones that didn't evolve that well. It could. So in this case, the robot didn't make those kinds of assumptions to start with immediately after the damage. Yep. But then how much time does everything up past that, the very green and the very red? Uh, we could do that. The very <laughs> green and the very red, right? Try out very different things. Our, the robot here is an optimist, and it says, I don't know what's gone wrong, but maybe I'll, maybe the thing that works best for the simulation, that at least that's a good place to start. Because I'm uniformly not confident about any of these, right? So if I don't know any, I don't, I'm not confident about which ones are going to work for the physical version of myself. I could do something random, but why don't I just start with the thing that seems to work the best? So that's what the robot does. So it picks this controller, which got the simulated hexapod to move a long distance. And our physical robot crosses its fingers, so to speak, and tries to cross the reality gap. 
So it carries out uh, it carries out that controller. You can see the damaged robot here. It's missing the lower part of its front left leg. And as you can probably imagine what happens, that doesn't work very well. This controller, which worked well on the simulated undamaged robot, works very poorly on the physical damaged robot. So, we, so now the, the physical robot recolorizes this pixel. It says it was red before. This guy traveled three meters. Now this guy only traveled 1.5 meters. So now it's green. And coming back to what Slayton said, the robot assumes that similar behaviors, so all the controllers that are near this point produce similar behaviors, they're also likely to not do very well on this robot. So using a Gaussian distribution, it moves outward from this point and reduces the fitness of these points around here. So the amount of reduction in fitness that this robot predicts decays outward from, from this point. Make sense? So if you look carefully, you can see this part, this part of the space still looks pretty much like this part, right? It says, I know this controller does badly, and these neighboring controllers, because they're similar, probably will also do poorly. So I'm going to decrease, I'm going to cool the colors of the pixels nearby using a Gaussian distribution. You'll notice also that the confidence layer has also changed. How has the confidence layer changed? Um, so it's become very red around the part that it did actually test because it is very confident that the data it got when it actually did it exactly. is probably right. Exactly. So if you imagine this pixel here, we go up to the corresponding pixel in the confidence layer, it says, I'm absolutely certain that this controller only allows me to travel 1.5 meters. It's not very good. Right? You'll notice that there's also a gradient now uh, outward from this point. So it also uses a Gauss Gaussian distribution in the confidence layer saying, I'm also pretty confident that close by controllers or similar controllers that produce similar behaviors are also going to do similarly badly. Make sense? Okay, I was going to ask you which controller the robot tries next, but you can see from the picture, from the cartoon here, right? It says, all right, let's go over here. At this point, at least did well for the simulated robot, but I'm not confident it will, but let's, let's try that. Does it always just go for the next highest point of um, fitness for the simulation that hasn't been changed by, like, the... Yeah, that, that's a very good question. No, the robot does not just naively go to the next most red pixel and try out the controller that it finds there. Are there any statistics majors here? Anybody know about Bayesian reasoning? It also is using its confidence here. So where the robot goes next is it looks for the highest value of a pixel multiplied by its confidence. So um, it's, looking, it's looking for controllers that have high fitness and also that the robot is relatively confident that they will transfer to the physical robot. Now in this cartoon here, all the rest of the confidence layer all has uniform low confidence. So it's really only based on this, this pixel, or the, the color of these, these pixels. So what, they, what the robot is really doing is taking every pixel in this layer and multiplying the value in that pixel, the confidence, by the value of the corresponding pixel in the behavior level. Right? How good do I think that controller does? And how confident am I that it's going to transfer to, the, to my physical self? But does that mean, though, that um, peaks closer to a phenotype that did very poorly? Because their confidence level is just the tiny, tiniest bit higher because they're like literally closer um, to the Gaussian on the confidence level. Does that mean that it would go to them next? Like, uh, it, it could be. Again, if you just do all of those 10,000 multiplications, multiply the value of each of the 10,000 pixels here by its corresponding pixel here, okay. 
If, the, if, if one of those multiplications is the highest value, then yes, it will go there next. But, but in this part, like the original phenotype <coughs> thing makes sure that there's not going to be just like, if they really are that similar to probably produce the same behavior, they won't be on different peaks. They'll be on the same peaks. That's right. Okay. So that's the assumption, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So in this, following this cartoon here, the physical robot chooses this controller to try out next. And that one also did very poorly, actually did worse than before, right? So now this region drops in fitness following a Gaussian distribution. This controller is colored green, does, that actually does poorly on the physical damage robot. And nearby controllers that produce similar behavior on the simulated robot are also predicted assumed to do badly, they are also made more green, right? Okay, and again, in the confidence layer up here, the robot says, I'm very confident that this green, that this pixel, this controller does badly. I'm, I, I'm, I have an intermediate level of confidence that this pixel or this controller, which hasn't been tried on the physical robot yet, is also gonna do poorly. Okay, so at this point, um, uh, it does that. The next time around, um, it tries something else, and eventually it hits on this controller, which does do well on the physical robot, so it stays red, and it's confident, it, its confidence is high. Okay. Let's imagine that we now go in and snap a second leg off of the robot. These two pictures haven't changed yet, but suddenly this pixel doesn't do very well on the, on the further damaged robot. So this area will get greener and this area will stay red because the robot is confident that this controller no longer works on the more damaged robot. If you were the more damaged robot, given the state of this cartoon at the moment, what would you try next? Where in the space would you go? You might go back where you were before, but again, it's hard to see in this cartoon, but actually this region over here is this, it's hard, who knows what's behind this picture, but let's just look at this region right here. This region is pretty far from this region. So if this region got more green when the robot got further damaged, this region probably didn't get more green because it's far enough away. And there's relatively high confidence around here, right? So it looks like in this cartoon here, the robot says, that controller over there worked and I'm pretty confident, so let's go over there, right? So it might not go back to the same place. Okay, so that's, that's the game that the robot plays, right? It's jumping, it's always replaying one of these original 10,000 controllers, but it's picking which one to do next based on its prediction of how well that controller is going to do and its confidence about that fact. Well, we ever need to update the confidence layer, well, I don't know what it but like, will it ever be smart to go backwards, you know, because if it didn't work when you had one leg missing, will it ever properly work if you have two, you know? Right, so the robot here, unlike the Resilient Machines project that I told you about about a month ago, right, this robot doesn't really know what the damage is, right? All we have is this robot and the undamaged robot, right? So it doesn't know what's happened. It just knows that this controller which produced fast movement before and got colored red, when it plays this controller again, suddenly it doesn't go anywhere and it colors this pixel green, right? And neighboring pixels green. The robot had, doesn't know that its leg has been broken. So it doesn't know that if it sustains further damage that maybe they cancel each other out or something like that, it can go back. The robot is never reasoning, I'm broken in this way so I should do this. 
All the robot is saying is, this strategy no longer works. I'm going to try a new strategy. Which of my 9,999 other controllers should I try next? And it uses these two sets of numbers to decide. OK. So this is known as Bayesian reasoning, where it's saying, I'm going to try something different. And I'm pretty sure that that thing over there works. And I'm also pretty confident that, it's, that it works. Right? It's multiplying the confidence by the prediction of how well it's going to work. OK, so let's look at some results from the paper. Um, they took the undamaged robot up here, which is condition C1. And they then inflicted five different kinds of damage on the robot. They snapped off the uh, bottom part of the robot's leg. They, uh, they torqued the motor. So now the robot's leg is still there, but its bottom leg is bent 90 degrees relative to where it should be. So it's there. It's just twisted. Removal of a complete leg altogether. C5, they completely removed two legs altogether. And in uh, case C6 here, they assumed that a kindly roboticist came in and put a peg leg on the robot, tried to fix it. But of course, it's not perfect, right? Its mass distribution is going to be a little bit different. It's still damaged. OK. So how did the robot do in all six of these cases? Well, let's have a look at that. So in the figure here, let's look at these first six columns, C1 through C6. Uh, corresponds to these six different conditions here. The vertical axis reports the walking speed of the robot in meters per second. So the higher a point is in this picture, the faster the robot moved. They took a pre-programmed controller, which produces the alternate tripod gait. If you remember our discussion about legged locomotion. So if you watch a six-legged insect, it will move front left, back left, and middle right together. And it will move front right, back right, and middle left together. Right. So the robot always has a tripod. Right. It's always balanced on three feet as it moves. That's a pretty standard gait that works well for hexapods. That's what the stars represent here. So if you take the controller that produces that standard alternating tripod gait and drop it into the undamaged robot, the robot travels uh, 0.25 meters per second, which is pretty good. You take that same controller that produces the alternating tripod gait and you drop it into any of the five damaged robots and they don't travel very far at all. That controller or that gait no longer works for these damaged robots. So in each of these five conditions, then, they played the game that I just walked you through. Right? The robot picks one of the 10,000 previously evolved controllers and tries it out and sees how well it does, and then updates its confidence and that behavior space, picks the next one, and goes through five or six or seven or eight of those. And at the end of those five or six or seven or eight trials, on average, how fast was the damaged robot moving? And you can see that in a lot of the cases with, with just a few trials, the robot has now started, has found a different controller that gets the damaged robot to travel almost as fast as the undamaged robot with the alternating tripod gate. Okay? So these bars here represent, on average, how well can the robot recover after damage. And in most cases, it's actually doing pretty well. Right? Our peg leg robot over here is actually doing, on average, better, given five or six or seven attempts to recover <clears throat> compared to the standard tripod gait. Make sense? OK. Um, what's being shown over here, they took two of the damaged conditions, C1, or sorry, the undamaged robot and C3, this one. And they played the same game again using an alternative descriptor. So what they mean by alternative descriptor is they picked a different way of describing or summarizing the phenotype. So as I told you here, one way to describe the phenotype would be to measure the average amount of time that the front two feet spent on the ground. You could do it in other ways, right? You could look at the orientation of the robot. 
So in the alternative to scripture, they took the angle of the robot. Well, which direction was it pointing? Uh, I think halfway through moving and at the end of moving. So that gives us two new numbers, right? Which direction is the robot heading, pointing halfway through movement and at the end of, of movement? It produces just a different two-dimensional picture, just a different way of describing the phenotype. And at least for C3, the C3 damage condition that they looked at, that different description also allowed the robot to recover after damage. Right? This was an attempt of the investigators to show that it maybe, maybe it doesn't matter too much how you choose to summarize the behavior of the robot to produce this uh, set of 10,000 controllers. So far, so good? OK. Here is our results from the same set of experiments. So we've got our same conditions down here on the horizontal axis. And now they're plotting on the vertical axis how much time did the robot need to recover to these levels. Right? So this shows you how much the robot recovered. And this shows you how quickly it did it. And as you can see, uh, it recovered in between one and two minutes. So it didn't, it didn't take too long. And if you take any one of these points, you can see on average how many trials or how many actual controllers the robot carried out in order to recover this much from damage. This was, this was the main result of this paper. Not only can the robot recover from damage, but it can recover quickly in one or two minutes after only trying between three and 21 new controllers. Okay? That's pretty good. So that's an advance over the work that I was involved in 10 years ago with the Resilient Machines Project, where we had a robot that could not only recover from damage but it could diagnose the damage. Remember that the resilient machine was evolving a simulation itself, and that simulation reflects the damage that the robot has suffered. The problem with that approach is it certainly, even if we did it today, rather than in 2006, it would take longer than one or two minutes, right? We were re-simulating or recreating, or the robot was evolving new simulators and using those new simulators to evolve new controllers, right? That takes a while. In this experiment, the robot is never creating new controllers. It's just testing out the 10,000 that it's already generated using the simulated robot. Yep. So pros and cons of these two approaches. The obvious pro of this approach is it's fast. The con is that the robot doesn't know what's happened to it, and there's a second major uh, limitation of this approach. What is it? How do you maintain the centrality of the machine whilst producing um, all the information? Um, exactly, right? So we're losing some information when we go down to this 10,000. So built into this approach is the assumption that somewhere in this set of 10,000 controllers is at least one that will recover from the damage. Right. Now, in these experiments, it seemed that they did. How, how will that scale up? Right? How many controllers do we need in order to make sure that all the thing, bad things that could happen to our robot, it's going to be able to recover? It's an unanswered question. But again, like all good research, it produces new, new questions to tackle. Right? What, is the, what is the minimal set of controllers that you need that will span a good set of all the bad things that could happen to the robot? Right, so you mean in that catalog of 10,000, it might not be the best catalog. Exactly. You got it in the past, and there was under different conditions. Could be, right? So what if the robot doesn't experience a broken leg? What if the robot uh, scuttles out onto ice? Are these 10,000 controller, is there at least one controller in this set of 10,000 that will allow the robot to walk well on ice? Who knows, right? That's, that's the issue. Is there maybe a different descriptor rather than a fraction of time that the legs spend on the ground? You might actually want to measure the angle at which the foot hits the ground, right? 
we're all Vermonters here, you know what happens when you go out on ice and your foot is actually hitting the ground and also moving away from your body. When you go out on ice, you make sure that the forces you apply to the ground are as vertical as they can be, right? That's an important behavioral descriptor if you're developing a robot probe for NASA and you're gonna send it to Titan, right? You better be thinking about how this robot moves on ice. Is the fraction of time that the foot spends on the ground gonna cover that? Maybe actually it does, who knows? We would wanna do that, that experiment and see. Okay, um, I wanna make sure to leave some time for discussion, so I'm gonna skip over a little bit here. They did the same thing with a different robot, which was a robot arm dropping uh, balls into a, a can. It also worked. Okay. I wanted to end with this, this picture here. I've been telling you that what the robot did was create this two-dimensional behavior space, dimension one and dimension two, which was the fraction of time that the front two feet spent on the ground. That's not actually what the investigators did. They reduced that infinite space not to a two-dimensional plane, but to a six-dimensional space, not surprisingly which represented each dimension in that six-dimensional space represented the fraction of time that any one of the six legs spent on the ground. This is a nice visualization in two dimensions of six dimensions. Okay, so how does this work? The long axes that you see here represent DIN 1 and DIN 2. So this dimension 1 ranges between 0 and 1, which is the fraction of time that the front left leg spends on the ground. The vertical position corresponds to the amount of time that the front leg, uh, front right leg spent on the ground. They took those continuous values between 0 and 1, and they bin them into five bins, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So they rounded it to 0%, 25%, 50%, 75%, or 100%. So they rounded it to the closest of those five percentages and dropped, and they did that for both dimensions, which now represent, we can now think of this space as a set of five by five bins. They took that point and they dropped it into the appropriate one of those 25 bins. Inside any one of those 25 bins that they dropped the point in, they then measured the fraction of time that the middle left and the middle right leg spent on the ground and average that to a percentage between 0, 25, 50, 75, and 100%. So now, you can now break that bin into a 5 by 5 set of bins. And given the fraction of time that these two legs spent on the ground, you can figure out which of those 25 smaller bins to drop the point into. I lost everyone. For five and six. For four and five, we, we, we've just done three and four, right? We're trying to right. figure out, right. we, we, have, we still have this whole picture, which is just a two-dimensional arrangement of pixels. We're trying to figure out, we're taking a controller, we've evaluated it on the hexapod, we've measured the fraction of time that all six legs spend on the ground, we're trying to figure out where to put that pixel. So we've rounded it, uh, we've discretized the fraction of time the front two legs spend on the ground, which tell us which of the 25 bins to drop it into. We visit that bin, we break that bin into a five by five set of bins, discretize the fraction of time that the middle two legs spent on the ground, which tells us which one <laughs> of the 25 smaller bins to drop that controller into. We go into that smaller bin and for the third and final time, we take that smaller bin and cut it into 25 really small bins, which are now 25 pixels. We measure the fraction of time that the back two legs spent on the ground, discretize that, and that tells us which of the 25 pixels that controller should go into. So we've gone from a con one controller that we've run on the hexapod, and we figured out which pixel within this two-dimensional array of pixels it goes into. So we're really placing it based on a six-dimensional space, but it's compressed into two dimensions. 
Make sense? OK, so what does this picture actually look like? Well, it looks like this. So after they've run their evolutionary algorithm and they've, they've done this, you can see that it looks like this. So let's take this region right here. So this region corresponds to the front left leg spending about this much time on the ground and the front right leg spending about this much time on the ground. And then inside this one, we can keep going in and know exactly where. Right? So you can see that there's some red pixels in there corresponding to a controller that causes the legs to spend about this much time on the ground. I like this picture because it's an actually nice way to try and visualize something that exists in six dimensions in just two dimensions, right? Even just looking at this visually, you can start to kind of figure out where the good places are. So you'll see there's some red in the middle of this overall picture. There's some red in the middle of each of these. There's some red that's in the middle of this bin. And there's also some red that exists inside the middle of this bin. What does that mean? What does that tell you about the redness that exists around here? Which controllers do those, do those red pixels correspond to? There it is, right? So controllers that's, that cause all six legs to spend about half the time on the ground. Well, there is a subset of those controllers. There's a huge number of controllers that cause all six legs to spend about half the time on the ground. Those are thrown away. But there do exist a bunch of them that get the robot to really move, right? Ones out here, these are kind of extreme cases, right? Things that are in the corner of the image as a whole that are in the corner of this bin, and that are in the corner of this bin, actually they're white, they were never filled in, they never found any controllers to fill those pixels. But generally speaking, when they did, those controllers were terrible. Which kind of makes sense, right? That means you've got one leg dragging, spending all the time on the ground, and other legs that are never touching the ground. Doesn't sound like a good recipe for fast-legged locomotion to me. OK, so then, now that even, we're, even though the robot is now, when it's trying out one controller after the other, it's moving through six-dimensional space, we can actually sort of see how it's jumping around. And again, when it jumps around and controllers don't work on the physical damaged robot, those pixels are cooled. And it eventually ends up, where does it start here? It starts here. Goes here, goes here, goes here, goes here, goes here, goes here, and ends up in a region of controllers that seem to be working pretty well for its damaged physical self. Okay. Thus ends lecture 28, our section on the reality gap and the course as a whole. Very last, very last figure I want to show you. Uh, has absolutely nothing to do with robotics. I always show this is the last picture of, uh, of, the, of the semester. Uh, some of you are juniors, some of you are seniors, some of you are going out into the real world. You can take what you want away from this picture. Um, I will tell you what I take away from it. This is economic data, so we're not looking at fitness curves anymore, right? Back in 1963, they measured uh, high school dropouts, high school graduates, those who had some college, those who had a college degree, and those who had gone to graduate school, and they looked at how much money they were making. In the years since 1963, they've also looked at those five groups of people and asked, are they making more money or less money than the individuals back in 1963, adjusted for inflation, growth of the economy, and so on. So the vertical axis here, over time, um, negative numbers indicate that you're, it, those individuals are now making less money than their, uh, than their uh, equivalents did back in 1963. And for the values that are positive, it represents, it 
indicates that that group is making more money relative to the same group back in 1963. So you can see that most uh, four of the five groups are generally doing better than their equivalents back in 1963. It is more disastrous now to be a high school dropout than it was back in 1963. That's what the fact that the blue curve is going down means. Uh, these three curves, things are about what they were back in 1963. They're worse than they were in 1973. The only group here, obviously, that is doing more better, it's not a term, right? Doing more better than their equivalents were back in 1963. Importantly, you can see that this uh, graph ends in 2008 which is an unfortunate coincidence because these curves probably changed quite a bit from 2008 to 2016. I've been doing some research. I've been trying to find continuation of this data since 2008. I haven't been successful. If anybody manages to do so, please send it to me. I'd love to update this, this graph here. The takeaway is stay in school, right? Or at least if you're going to work for a company do consider coming back to graduate school. Um, yes, there are widening economic disparities in our society. It is not just between rich and poor, but uh, between those that are educated and those that aren't. And the wide, most widening gap is between those that now have a graduate degree and those that do not. OK, that's my piece of advice for those of you that are leaving us this semester. I'm sorry I've left us a grand total of four minutes to have an open discussion. So uh, let's, let's have at it. What do you think happened in 1981? <laughs> 1981. Yeah, good question. I don't know. <laughs> do you think robotics in general is heading towards At the moment, more emphasis on machine learning, right? There's been a huge advance in machine learning having to do with deep belief networks or neural networks that have lots of layers, right? In this class, we've talked about sensor layer, maybe a hidden layer, maybe a motor layer. The big advance in machine learning has been how do you add more and more layers and how do those layers help you solve machine learning problems? There's been a big advance in that and autonomous cars and all sorts of things are now using deep belief networks, not so much an emphasis on, on evolution. Do you think that that's because of advances in hardware, better chips, or because of learning? Uh, the oh, answer no. is it was because of three things. So faster computers, more training data, just having more data to train on, and some algorithmic advances that have to do with how neural networks are built. How do you actually properly propagate signals from the input layer to the, the output layer? Which unfortunately we haven't had a chance to talk about in this, in this class, but clearly it is fomenting a, a revolution in AI. So again, it is actually a good time to be going out in industry. A lot of interesting things going on in, in AI. How important would you say a knowledge of neuroscience is to being an evolutionary or just general roboticist? It's very useful to have some neuroscience knowledge. The algorithmic advance that was made in deep belief networks was because some people paid very careful attention to the visual cortex. So when photons arrive at your eye, they're processed through multiple layers in your visual cortex, which is combining features that are um, signaled by those photons. So looking at the hierarchical arrangement of layers in the visual cortex helped the, make the advance of how to create neural networks that have lots of different layers. So a knowledge of neuroscience definitely is useful if you want to contribute to the algorithmic advances going on in uh, machine learning. Of course, I would love to see a revolution in evolutionary robotics as well. We're not quite there yet. Um, ho hopefully it happens. If you were to ask me about it, I think 3D printing will also help. So a big part of the revolution in machine learning was having more data. In robotics and evolutionary robotics, we're talking about action, right? We want to try and evaluate a robot that millions of robots that perform lots of different actions. It's a hard thing to do, even equipped with the fast 
physics engine, right? If we can print out and evaluate thousands or millions of robots that have different body plans, that might pave the way to really showing that evolution can, can contribute to the AI revolution. But that hasn't happened yet. We'll, we'll see what the future holds. This is a bit of a robo-ethics question, but do you think we'll ever get to the point, I guess culturally, where we use terminology we might apply to mice uh, to robots, like sacrifice or, um, oh. I mean, I've worked in a lab, and it's like, right. there's a very specific mindset that we get about all of the Yes, that is a very difficult question, right? So we could try and program into our machines a fear of being terminated. At the moment, they don't have one. Yeah. We have a fear of being terminated for very good evolutionary reasons. We may or may not put them in our machines, or they may indirectly evolve that right. dynamic because of other fitness functions, and then we should probably be a little careful. Until then, go ahead and rip the legs off your robots. Don't yeah. worry about it. Okay, good luck with your final projects. Again, I apologize. I won't be here in person for the oral presentations. I will try and attend via Skype. Please do the course evaluations if you haven't. There will be a quiz tonight on the last part of robots that can adapt like animals. Thanks for your uh, attendance and appreciation.